Hello, beautiful human. You clicked on our interview with Raja Kumari, and dude, sister has an energy about her that is just, it's infectious, but it's also on like a higher level. And her mission here on Earth is, I, I just can't wait for you to hear it from her. It's really cool. It's really inspiring. And she looks at art and she looks at our world through such a different lens. Um, please leave your honest feedback in the comment section below. We do have a podcast, link in the description below. And yeah, if you can, if you want to, please subscribe and enjoy the interview. Here's Raja Kumari. Let's do this. Hey, we got uh, Dan, we got Heather. Yep. We got oh. Raja Kumari in the studio. Okay. Okay. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> what, what, what did you say? Yeah. I said namaste. You oh. know, yeah. namaste. Yes, that's you know, it's I, just, Namaste. Namaste. Yeah, namaste. That's beautiful. It's kind of like, you know how Loa has like hello and goodbye? Yeah. Same thing for Indians. Uh, it's nice. Namaste. But you're from California. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. So. Uh, why so Indian? No, no. I just want to know what your culture. So like, what was your house like? My what? house is uh. India on the inside, hundred nice. percent. Like, nice. like they have like gold on their like they have pillars with like little gold on it. There's like it's very much India. My mom, uh, she's an artist, so you know we learned a lot about classical music, and you know it was all about. I, I was training in Indian classical dance at the age of six. Wow. Cool. So, so they really, I don't want to say forced the culture on you, but raised you within the culture. Yeah, I think my parents, since they came in the 70s, they left India. I think they took it upon themselves to make sure that I was like a vessel of culture. I think when you leave the motherland, you hold on more than the people that are actually there. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people my age, when I go to India, they're like, you're more Indian than us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like, well, this is the way I was raised. You know, we, we learned about all of it at home and we had to. And then outside of of course, I was American, so I was listening to what everyone else was listening to. I was in hip hop dance classes. How do you combine both worlds in your everyday life, right? Like, how, I mean, obviously, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. The gold jewelry, <laughs> you know, yeah. everything. I think I just I just realized what I love about the culture, and it's always going to be like the beauty, like the jewelry, the colors, the fabrics. So I just try to find a way to, you know, enjoy it every day. Every day is, a, you know, especially getting dressed. Like Indian women, we love to like decorate every inch possible, you know. So it's like like if we have earrings, we have the bindi, we'll have our henna on our hands and then the rings and, and then the anklets. And it's like, that's my culture. That's where we came from. So I just try to bring that into my daily life. It is. It's beautiful. Thank you. And I, I, what you brought up, what you said about people who live in India, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like they just kind of get used to it. They almost take it for granted. That's their everyday life. Yeah, they almost want to be westernized. Like, I feel like it's so interesting. It, it took an American-born Indian person to come back to India to remember, like, to remind people to wear their bindis again, which is this little dot thing that I'm wearing. People want what they don't have. Yeah, I, I think, like, um, you know, they're just in... I, I, I feel that people in, in India are in a hurry to be westernized because, you know, this globalized culture of, like, western culture, you know, whatever it is, but... I'm now seeing this like this resurgence of this like accepting the roots and authenticity. Like I was part of that movement and I'm seeing other people in India be proud of like, you know, where they come from. And it's just like there hasn't been a cool Indian. If you think about every Indian on TV, it's like <laughs> starts with Apu, Nahasi Peter Petalan, <laughs> that like is feeding peanuts to, you know, like a Ganesh. And then, you know, then there's like every nerd on every like on, you know, any show. Yeah. It's always like this really nerdy scientist. So I think like when they see somebody that looks like them doing something that they think is cool, it kind of gives them the confidence to just step out of their box. You're defying a stereotype, but also like, but playing into the culture, right? At the same time. Yeah, like I always say culture first. I think it just, it's so important to me. I think because I grew up in Los Angeles, it was my identity. It was like the way that I stayed connected to where I'm from. And because the classical dance was my, my roots are in classical Indian dance. So, you know, there's five classical styles in India and they're from different regions. And, you know, it goes back thousands of years. You can go to temples in India and they have all the, the, the sculptures are all like the dance posture. And it's, you know, it's very technical. They talk about it in the Vedas. So the fact that I learned that and that was part of my life, it always made me obsessed with the culture. Like I could never let it go. I always was imagining these like ancient times with like these crazy crowns and these clothes. Because like when you go on stage as a classical dancer, it takes three hours to put the whole costume on. And the wow. performance is beautiful. I mean, it's insane. It's like the movement is so beautiful. And, you know, I was lucky my parents loved art. So they just really... As soon as I was five years old, even before, before that, I wanted to perform. 
they just wanted to keep supporting that. Was your sense of individuality in Los Angeles, which I mean, growing up here is a very unique experience because you're kind of competing, you yeah, know, always. almost yeah. everybody, you know, the kids in your school have the famous parents, yeah. the executive parents who's going out on auditions. Did you define yourself as a person in this city based on your culture? Um, you know, I actually grew up in Claremont, which is like a little bit further out of the city. So I was shielded from some of that yeah. type of chaos. But I mean, you know, the Indian culture is just like, I can't let it, I can't leave it behind. Like, I think even music, uh, even my idea of music comes from my understanding of classical dance. And that has to do with the rhythms. Like, all Indian classical dance is about these thals, these rhythms. So it's like, da, 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 da. That's like the type of sounds we were working with. So as soon as I kind of got the Fuji's album, I started listening to Wu-Tang and Tupac. I just realized that they're doing the same thing. They're just rapping on these rhythms that I already know that are, that I know that they like, you know, they move together in these certain ways. And it just became like, you know, something to experiment with. So. Is that when the Indian princess is born? Yes, the Indian princess. I used to be in ciphers in high school. I would like, you know, my friends were all rappers and I just really was into that. And I would be the only girl almost in the cipher and they would always call me, you know, they'd be like, pass it to the princess. And <laughs> yeah, I guess I just exude that vibe from the beginning. Totally. <laughs> and I just felt like I didn't want, I, I didn't want them to call me IP. Like I was like really young. I was like 14. So I was like, no. Oh, I P U P. We all P. Like <laughs> this can't be my name. And then I was like, fine. If you want to call me that, then you should say it in Sanskrit. And then that's Rajkumari. Oh, that's so it means the daughter of the king. So uh, wow, you I do, blew your mind just now. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, so you do your first freestyle. You're with a group of dudes. Yeah. Like, are you are you nervous at first to step into that? Like, have you practiced before? No. You get invited to freestyle. People? You know, the funny thing was they were all rappers and I could sing. So anytime I ever got stuck, I just start singing and they would be like, wow. Like, so I never <laughs> would fall off. I could just start being like, ooh, ooh and they just like would be like so into that. Like, even that little ooh ooh would be like enough, you know? <laughs> and that's when so you step out. That would just be like, it's enough. And they would be like, oh, it was perfect. So, yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm sure there was moments, but I was just really fearless because there wasn't really anyone, no females really in my high school that were really like about singing or being uh -huh. out there. So I just, just did it. I didn't really, ha I mean, because I was a performer since I was a child, it was just natural to try. You start yeah. with dance, 14, you become a freestyle or an MC. Yeah. yeah. When do you write your first song? Around that same time. Okay. Do you like, remember it? Oh, actually the first song I ever wrote was like the third grade. It was me and my friend. I remember it. It was really funny because I thought I was so smart because like the play on the words, it was like, I know that you know that we should be together. And I Ooh. thought I was so smart because I know that you know. I feel like I've heard that in a together. song. Actually. I'm sure. It's like, you know, I, after like, you. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's probably like the easiest little thing. But <laughs> I wrote that when I was a kid. Then I started writing. But really, I started really writing around like 14, 15 because I started doing this practice where I would pick up pick out songs that I really loved and then just be like an Indian nerd about it. And then I would just be like, let's outline it. And I'd be like, wow, this word is repeated and it repeats three times. And this is iambic pentameter and this is an AABA. -A -A. And like I started just taking, like just figuring out what the math was behind. You scientifically broke down a song. I did. And I was like, wow, okay, so this is why I like it. And then I was like, let me try to write a song in the same pattern. And I would try to use those little like, okay, I realized if I said something three times, like no one forgets it. Yeah. And if I, if I rhyme internally, if I don't just rhyme the last words, if I also rhyme the halfway point, it feels better. So I just started studying the greats and trying to teach myself. Whoa. That's and really cool. Really nerdy about it. <laughs> I went all the way in. And who is like your first session ever? Like, who are you in the room with? How do you get into the studio and who's it with? Oh my gosh. My first session ever was with a guy named Damon Elliott. And he was, he produced on the Destiny's Child album. Cool. Nice. Mm. And the way that I met him is his friend came, was like, in the area I lived in and like had knocked on my door because they were like, can we film near your house? <laughs> And then I was like, what do you mean? What are you going to film? A music video? And I was like, oh, I, I sing. <laughs> and then he's like, okay, sing for me. And I just sang a Christina Aguilera Reflections. And I used nice. to like sing really loud when I was young. It would like shake the walls. Like I like, <laughs> I had no idea how to control like the volume of my voice. So I think people were just like, okay, she's got talent. We don't know what to do. So he took me to Damon, who was his childhood friend. And then I did like maybe six months of vocal training. And then I recorded with him. Whoa. Yeah. So that's your first time in the studio. Yeah. I remember seeing pictures of Christina. Aguilera with like one headphone off and then I remember being in the booth and being like take the headphone off <laughs> and then I was like oh you can hear yourself that's why they do it like it was I learned about it on the microphone like I it was 
crazy. You have a couple hits under your belt. Centuries by Fall Out Boy is, yes. I mean, dude, great that was, record. That was a crazy, crazy record to be a part of. So you were a part of it. Like, what, did you all create it together in the room? Did oh you God. come with ideas? That would have been the wildest session in the world had we all been together <laughs> right. in the room. But actually, um, it started with Justin Tranter, okay. myself, and J.R. Rodham. Got it. So the three of us had been writing a lot. Like, you know, we also did the um, Gwen Stefani project together yes. and the uh, Fifth Harmony. So th- this was my crew. This is what we were doing. Not a bad crew to roll Not with, my friend. Not a bad crew, you know. They're both, I love them both. They're both really awesome. So we were, um, you know, just, we had done three day session. We'd done three different songs. It was like the last day. And we're like, you know what? Let's just try a chorus. It took us 15 minutes. I just, me and Justin, Justin walked in. He's like, what about Remember Me for Centuries? I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> and then I just went in there and I always do melodies. I'm like the melody person. So went in there, we wrote it in 15 minutes. And I remember when I was singing it, I had this like vision of like, I was like on a golden chariot because it made me feel like that. I was like, yes, galloping on a golden chariot of fire. And then (laughs) when I saw the music video and they're like in this like Coliseum amphitheater, Mm -hmm. I was like, I wonder if I like, like imprinted my energy enough (laughs) that like made them make this video. But you know, so they basically wrote it as an idea for like, I don't know, like Jay-Z, Rihanna. Was that who you were pitching it yeah, for originally? Yeah, like, that was my idea. Like I was like, well, maybe Rihanna would sing this. And then, you know, my publishers heard it, played it for them, and they heard themselves in it. And that was what's so crazy about it because it taught me as a songwriter to never um, restrict a song or think that I know where a song's going to go. Just write the song. It's going to find its home. That's it. And they heard themselves in it, and they wrote their verses. They changed the course. You know, they made it their own song. But, you know, the original part, the yeah, 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 like, you know, that all came from us. And the most, the craziest thing about that song, it went on, you know, it was like on NFL, it was everywhere. And like, you know, my family was like legit, like, wait, I think she writes music. I think, <laughs> I think she's doing something, you know, <laughs> that was cool. But the craziest moment for me attached to that song was almost way later. I was in India and I get a call and someone sends me a clip of Kobe Bryant walking out to his final game with the Lakers and he chose Centuries. Cool. Nice. And I was just That's like, cool. whoa, this like melody that came out of my mind on a random day mm-hmm. is now part of history forever with one of the greatest basketball players of all time in Los Angeles. <laughs> like, this is insane. I'm part of his history whether he knows it or not, you know? Is, is that one of the most validating moments for you when it comes to like understanding the power of music? Yes, like the fact that we write the soundtrack of people's lives That's is it. insane. It's insane. And like, also like I always try to remember that not every Everybody can really hear music, like write it. They yeah. don't hear the lyrics or the melodies. So I almost feel like it's my job to make sure I emote that and do it so that, you know, somebody that feels alone, they can hear something and not feel as alone and have something that expresses what they're going on and what's happening in their life in that moment. So I take it seriously. When you get in the room with Gwen Stefani, yes. do you actually get in the room with her? Oh, yeah. It was just Gwen, myself, Justin, and JR, the four of us. That's why she calls it the Breakfast Club, because it was like, why are we together? <laughs> like, but how do you get into this group with Justin Tranter and JR? I mean, Justin Tranter is one god of the- god of pop music. Yeah, dude. Yeah. He's, he's one of the greatest <laughs> songwriters of all time. Yeah, he is. He's definitely one of the greatest songwriters of all time. We just got in a room together early, and you know, he was in a band called Summit Precious Weapons at the time, yeah. and you know, we just had a lot of fun, and he just loved writing with me, and we just kept doing it how'd you meet him just my publisher put me in a session with him wow, that's right timing right yeah. because like you know now i'm sure he takes sessions but it's like that i don't even think so he perfect. takes sessions dude no. like, he's like yeah no uh it's katie hard. vinton who is his publisher at warner chapel she discovered me so she put us together that's so she was like i got someone for you dude and it was you know best session that she ever put me in you know wow and when he, do you know why he picked you? Why he decided to keep working with you? Like, what was that magic between you guys? I think we just understood each other. We had a lot of fun. Like, I, I my melodies are kind of fearless and different. Like, I, I guess I'm inspired by the East and other, you know, other things. I hear other music that other people don't necessarily listen to. So, the path that I take melodically is different and I do a lot of rhythmic fun stuff and you know Justin just has the other half of what I needed like he had whatever I was lacking in he was there you know he had all whatever weaknesses I have are his strengths so it was just a perfect match for songwriting for us are you still doing sessions for other people yeah definitely I'm back into it now like I like I returned from India and I I just missed it honestly like I I remember when I put when I started doing my artist project I was like done with songwriting because I was done being a surrogate mom like I was like I'm tired of making these babies and giving them away is that, is that the hardest part it is sometimes but i think that you know you know what songs for you and what's for someone else and i don't think i think all the songs that i wrote as a songwriter they weren't for me they were for them like it was you know it was like i i was supposed to emote it so they could you know go through whatever they were going through in their life with that song 
But how, how do you how do you know though? Like because like you can you can listen to centuries and like second guess the entire time. But like maybe centuries wouldn't be what it is today. No, it wouldn't have been without Fallout Boy. Yeah. I mean that record is everything because Fallout Boy heard themselves in it, and that's the most amazing gift of that record that it was open enough for them to hear something, you know, because getting, I mean, how else would I have ever gotten a room with like Pete Wentz? Like what a random combination. <laughs> right? But now we have the same trainer. So I like randomly see him and I'm like, Hey, what's what, up? what a cool life you <laughs> have. Up, yeah, Come no, on. No, life is crazy. Hollywood trainers. I literally, um, like, I really like asked for this a couple years ago. I was like, all I want to do is travel. All I want to mm. do is have my music take me all over the world. And it's like now, as I look at my schedule and I'm like, Hey, I have half a day in LA and then I have to take a 10 hour flight to Singapore and then do this I'm like damn you know you really get what you asked for so yeah, you right. gotta like be you know be that, conscious of the conscious of that dude put it out into the universe exactly manifestation is very powerful I believe in it when you go into the studio for yourself compared mm -hmm. to like going into a session for somebody else what is the biggest difference in your mind like how do you approach it um I think like I um like, do you have an idea when you're going in for you what no, you want to do I never have an idea when I walk in I feel like the song is in the atmosphere and the people that are in the room are meant to be in the room and they're going to hear certain parts of each song. I'm really a fan of the co-write. Like I, I can write songs by myself, but I think the songs always come out better if someone's with you because if they can relate and understand completely with the words you're saying, you have a better chance of more people understanding it. Like I, I do write songs by myself, but you know, I think like when we get in the room, it's in the air and it's just our job to like hear it and transmit it and just like get the frequency of it. Cause there's a lot of great melodies, but there's only a few like ones that are right, you know, like you have to pick the right ones. Are you not afraid to share? When you're in a room with strangers or a room with writers you might not know? Strangers are just friends you haven't met yet. Aww. It's beautiful. That's cute. <laughs> yeah, that tattooed on me. Aww. That is really nice. I mean, you don't know, especially if we're in the room, there's a purpose for it. So, I've, you know, everybody has like their, their different way of working. And I, I've never really, I have yet to meet somebody who just goes into the room and lets the energy kind of sway. Completely. I just walk in. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I literally just like to, we pick a track that I already think like a groove or an idea musically that I think is already going to impact. And you build. And then I just freestyle on it melodically, no words, because I've realized that since I, I participate in music in many different regions with many different languages, I realize that language is secondary. Melody is king. So melody is the most important language. So as long as the melody is killing it and like the va like the vowels will be there. So I just try to stick to like the sounds I said. But the first thing that comes out of my mouth is usually the right thing. And it's like if I'm not in front of a mic, I, sometimes I lose it. I lose the song. Are you? Do you want to put different languages on the radio here in the states? I would love to. To, cool. to like growing up as somebody that never ever saw an Indian person on television on radio. The, I can like list the times I saw Indians growing up. One was the black and white music video for Michael Jackson. He has an Indian classical dancer that appears for two seconds. It was the first time I ever saw myself in America. Like we did not have anybody anywhere, you uh -huh. know. So. The idea that you could hear like a da 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 or like hear like a little bit of Hindi or just a word of Hindi is insane because there's a little Indian girl that doesn't know she should be proud of being Indian or be happy with who she is because there was times growing up where I thought I needed to dye my hair blonde or I wished I had blue eyes or, you know, everybody goes through that if you don't see yourself. Yeah. So, you know, just visibility is so important. Representation is like, it's so important. And I don't know, you know, I don't know who's watching me and who they're going to be. I might be training the future of the world, that's you know, it. like there might be some crazy musician that's coming out in 10 years that's listening to me right now. And I have to take that seriously. That's a responsibility. It is. It is. Do you feel like there is, I mean, obviously a big responsibility for you to bring the Indian culture to America in a way that hasn't been done before? Yeah, I think it hasn't been done and it needs to be done. I think I, I was always really inspired by watching Ricky Martin and how he had that moment and then there was this huge Latin explosion yes. and now you can, Despacito is a number, song, one, number one song in the whole world and it's like, okay, so Spanish is suitable for the world. Hindi is also suitable for the world. The and you felt that moment when J-Ho happened, Slumdog Millionaire, mm -hmm. and it opened the doors but then now we have to keep pushing the door open. That's it. Because, it's so, but somebody needs to. Yeah. I, you know, musically. I mean, we have a lot. We're. I mean, we're killing it. Priyanka Chopra. What am I? What am I supposed to say? We're killing the game. <laughs> Mindy Kaling. I, mean, I saw your post the other day. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Mindy's out there. Like, we're killing it. We're really pushing, and it's it's a great time. It's a great time to be doing this, especially in America right now. Hassan Minaj, Aziz Ansari, yeah. Mindy Kaling. I mean, I can just keep listing it because it's the first time we've ever 
had like we call it the brown excellence like the brown <laughs> revolution the brown renaissance it's like really funny but it's here and musically you know i look around and i notice that like i've had amazing opportunities to be in the room with timbaland to be in the room with scott storch and to work with sean garrett and work with the dream and tricky and all these people and a lot of my you know a lot of people from India or people that are trying to do this haven't had that chance. So, you know, it's important that I, you know, really use all that knowledge that was given to me and try to really make it happen. And I think we're in a different phase of our world when it comes to like accepting other languages. Yeah. We're playing BTS every night on the radio. That's crazy. Dude, their song is a majority in Korean, you know? I know. It's amazing. Like it's I, I think we're just in a different world right now but because that, it's we a need good to accept. space. I think like the rest of the world uh, outside of America, as I travel more and more, and, and I and I live in other places for like prolonged periods of time, so I can kind of experience it. It's like it's a global um, culture, and then sometimes in America, it's so big, and we have so much culture within America that we actually isolate. We isolate ourselves, and I think that only good can come from this. Only great things can come from us having cultural exchange. And especially from someone who is an American. Like, I think a lot of times, like, when I first got to India, they'd be like, you're not Indian. And I'd be like, dude, in America, they're telling me I'm not American. Like, Where one of you guys go? has got to claim this. Like, <laughs> come on. I'm like, I'm the bridge. I'll just be both. Put one foot in each place. But, you know, it's, you know, it's important that we're American. This is part of American culture, too. That's why on my album cover, I have the American flag across my I face. I love it. Because I was like, this is America. This is, this is the new America. You know, this is what it looks like. I am so sorry to interrupt the interview. I'll just be real quick. Get Quip. It's the best toothbrush out there. I'm obsessed with this thing. It sticks right to my mirror. It's timed out perfectly, so I always know that I'm brushing the right amount. They send me refill heads like every month, and that's not just for convenience. It's for my health. Plus, Quip is an amazing toothbrush. It's electric, and it starts at only 25 bucks. $25 for really the best toothbrush you will ever buy. I got it for Dan, Heather, my mom, my sister, my dad. Oprah uses this toothbrush, so why shouldn't you? Quip. Seriously, it's the best. Go to getquip.com slash sang and you're going to get a toothbrush starting at 25 bucks, and your free refill pack will follow. That's right. You'll get something free if you go to getquip.com slash sang. Try out the Quip toothbrush. You'll love it, but I really want you to tell me what you think. So use it and get back to me. Getquip.com slash sang. Okay, back to the interview. But it's like it's it's next generation that really needs to kind of carry that through because mm -hmm. it's our generation, it's our peers and, you know, Generation Z and the generation after that that's going to be accepting of it. Yeah. You know, some of the older people that, you know, kind of, but I, they're the I, ones holding the door closed a little bit. Maybe, but I think that you can see with Indian culture, we're also in a good space because everybody loves tikka masala and everybody <laughs> so loves good. samosas. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and I, and you know, people, when they go to Coachella, they love to wear bindis and, you know, everyone mm -hmm. likes henna now. You know, when I was growing up, people used to make fun of me telling me I had hand diseases because when it's mean. when it's fading it looks crazy <laughs> so it's like it's a great time to bring Indian culture into the mainstream because people are really receptive and I would just want to make sure everyone knows yoga was not in, you know invented in Malibu like <laughs> like as long as everyone knows that then we're good well, it's interesting you say that because I was gonna ask about cultural appropriation a lot of people would be like no that's our culture you're stealing it but clearly you aren't bothered at all I think that we need to we need to teach each other I think that the Western world is lacking in some peace and serenity due to their distance from the East. And I believe that we are one world, like like meditation belongs to all of us. Yoga belongs to every human being. And I believe the bindi belongs to everyone too. And the reason I wear it is because it's my spiritual third eye. And I'm saying that I'm illuminated. I'm choosing to see it through my spiritual eye rather than the two eyes. And I feel like that can be for everyone. But I don't think people know what the bindi is. So that's why I just want to talk about it. I just want people to have the choice and it not be like a costume. Like I did see bindis in the Halloween store next to the geisha oh. and, the, and the Afro wig. And like that happens in America. America, but it's it's not anyone's fault because there hasn't been someone Indian standing up being like, hey, by the way, it's, it's cool. We can all do this. Appropriation is like when you exclude us mm -hmm. and you put it on like a costume. Like you still want to make it your own? Yeah. Like I, I think it evolves. I don't think I think like when hip hop was created, they couldn't control what happened. Now we have hip hop from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Hence, you can go all over and see different languages. I can't control where this goes, I just want people to know what it, where it comes from so they can take it and, and put it in their lives however you know they see fit. Dude, 
music is a universal language. It and is. I think what you're doing really embodies that. And I'm a huge supporter of that because I believe in a global world as well. Yes. And uh, I think that is where we're going because yes. the internet has connected everybody in so many different ways, in new ways than ever before. And education is literally at our fingertips. And everybody can research what a bindi is. Yes, they can. If they want to. They but. Want to. Having somebody in their face, you know, releasing music that they dance to at a club. Yeah. Being the one wearing it. And that's why they figure it out. And that's what, how they learn about it. Familiar brown face. Dude, it's even better. Like. Yeah. I, I mean, I just think that a lot of times, I mean, I am American. I grew up here. I went through the same shielding, you know, mental things. And then when I went outside and started traveling, I opened my mind. So I know how important travel is to doing that. It doesn't just like, they don't just give it to you. Even me, I, I needed to go out there. It's just like, you know, sometimes we turn our eye the other way and we don't try to think about what's happening on the east side of the world, you yeah. know, but it's like I look Iraqi, I look Iranian, I look Pakistani, I look Indian, we all look the same. So if you love me and you're willing to listen to me, maybe you might think a little bit more about what's going on over there. That's, hey, hell yeah. That's, Have you found it hard for the hip hop community to accept you as one of them? Oh, no. I mean, I think people have been really receptive because I explain like the reason I love hip hop is because... I see where it comes from. Like, I know that where hip-hop comes from. I know uh, that it, it was born in New York. I, I know yeah. the people that, that... You know the history. I know the history. But I'm talking about the history of that, like, the sound. Like, it comes from these tribal rhythms and these things that are ancient to all humans. And that's why hip-hop is the most powerful genre in the whole world because it's, it's like hitting these tones in people's like their soul that they don't understand and it's because it comes from something more ancient. like Centuries, and se right? Like, millennium i'm trying to tell you like you know there's in indian classical music which you know they talk about in the vedas which is ten thousand years old we talk about these rhythms okay so in my song mira i did this like you know this um like an experiment so i was thinking about why is hip-hop and and where does it come from so it's like that's classical music, right? So, Dalang Gutaka de Gutaka Tadingin at home, Raja Kumari daughter of the king. How long you think that you could keep up with my tempo? Dance to the rhythm, dance in the Himalay. Uh, ain't hearing what they say. Dinner, dinner, heart beating like the bass. Uh, heart beating like the bass. Uh, heart beating like the Dalang Gutaka de Gutaka Tadingin at home, Daki Tataka, Daki Tataka Jim. Dalang Gutaka de Gutaka Tadingin at home, dance to the rhythm, dance in the Himalay. Uh, ain't hearing what they say. <laughs> But it's like whoa, That's, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. But yeah, it's, chills. It's the same thing. It's yeah. So when I discovered that, I discovered I was not an outsider to hip hop, and I can't let anybody tell me I don't belong. Cause I'm like, do you know where that comes from? <laughs> yeah. Do you know where those bass rhythms come from? Do you know why it feels like that? Because African tribal music, Indian tribal, whatever tribal ancient music has its roots there, and that's why hip hop moves all of us. That. It's well, uh, beautiful. As someone who knows so much about it, what do you think about you know these young kids that just hear a random beat, throw a couple lines over it, and now they're rappers and they're successful and they have number one songs? There's there's a place for everyone. Hip hop is such a huge genre. Like I think everybody should make the music they want to make. And um, I personally like to use my chance of speaking to the people to say something. Um, you know, when I'm songwriting, sometimes I might write those touch my body records, you know, for other people. But, you know, when I get on the mic, I'm I'm inspired by Lauren Hill. You mm -hmm. know, she's the last one that really spoke to the people and, and spoke to men and, you know, spoke knowledge into people's ears and did it in a way that, you know, they could have fun. But they were hearing something that they were listening to that made sense. And I, I strive every day to try to be like my musical mother. <laughs> <laughs> I would be nothing without Lauren Hill. <laughs> when you're... Do you produce? Like, obviously, when you're building these beats, are you solely inspired by music that was made a millennia ago? No. Um, I just, like, I think the, the ancient music is in my blood. So that's just what I bring. It's just like when I when my, I open my mouth and I put my tone on the record, you just, you just are, you're connected to the, yeah. you're just connected to the ancient side. It just comes out. Um, I, I just um, I just try to find ways to just sneak it in because I just think it's fun because I, ne I never got to hear it. I imagine right. being a classical Indian dancer as a kid growing up in America, never hearing anything and then imagine like, what if I had heard that? Like, I would have felt so much more seen. Yeah. I would have felt like accepted or that they, it was okay to be me, you know, so. But it also makes a great song. You know I mean, what it's mean? A Like, lot it of makes fun. you move. It, yeah, you like, feel you, it. you know, remember Timbaland had that whole period in 2002 where he was just going in on Indian music mm -hmm. and the whole world was captivated and I, and I believe that, you know, 
it can happen again. MIA kicked the door open. Mm -hmm. You know, she is the first person that gave like an archetype for people to understand. Like, I think that without the work she did, you know, people maybe wouldn't have been able to digest what I'm doing too, you know? Because it's like, it, it's everybody has to play their part, you know? Who did the record Jai Ho? Was that like the Pussycat Dolls? Well, Pussycat Dolls did the English version. It Got was it. first produced by A.R. Rahman. He's actually singing it, who is, you know, he's the greatest musical director in India. I'm actually, I say my musical mother is Lauren and my musical father is A.R. Rahman. <laughs> so I'm like their musical baby, if they ever had one. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually had the pleasure of working with him and this is pure manifestation i put pictures of him on my vision board and you know i got to meet him and i have his he gave me his piano like i have his Ooh. piano in my house because he was like practice on this like <laughs> i have this crazy experience with him but you know he he made that song and he made that music that made the whole world move you know and that was a crazy proud moment for all of us you know and you were okay with pussycat dolls no i mean like they Being wanted the they wanted to they were the English version. There was yeah. a Hindi version that, of I, course. that I enjoyed. I think that I think people want to participate in Indian culture. I don't blame people for wanting to participate in the fun. I mean, have you seen our weddings? They go on for <laughs> oh five my days. God. Crazy. Oh, yeah. We got great. the dole. You know, we go. We have fun. <laughs> and like, just like when you uh, see like a like a like you go to quinceanera and there's like mariachi music and all this fun stuff. It's like that's fun. You want to be a part yeah. of that. You know. So I don't blame them, and I don't think they did anything wrong. You know, they they didn't do anything wrong. No, yeah, I you guys know how to party. I went yeah. to a, a Indian Sweet Sixteen once. Oh, oh yeah. my God, it was the funnest time I've ever had in my life. We go in. We definitely go in. Oh, so good. That's our thing. I loved it. I yeah. attended a bat mitzvah next door to an Indian wedding, okay. so I didn't attend, but I, I saw from the outside the festivities. Oh, yeah. It was it's, a show. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. What's the drink of choice in Indian culture? For Indian uncle? Black Label whiskey. Ooh. Oh, wow, oh, wow, really? Yeah, nice. That is that is a, I call it a drunkle drink. <laughs> a drunkle. <laughs> is there a booze version of a mango lassie? Ah, there should be. Yeah, I would love that. Yeah, there should be. But I'd pretty much put... anything mango is like an Indian wood. Like if you had the choice of like mango, like orange, and you kept giving me options, it's like I'm not a real Indian if I don't pick mango. <laughs> like I, I, I can't, I got to take the bindi off. Like it's over. Was it important for you to build a career in India before, I mean, while you're building a career here in the States? You know what's so crazy? Ever since I was young, I like predicted it. I was like, I have to start in India because for me to, um, you know, do the music that I want to do, I have to have the support of my people. And if you go to India and ask them who's Raja Kumari and they don't know, then I'm like failing. Like a complete, I, I can't, who am I to stand in front of the world and try to represent people that don't know me? You know, so I always knew I had to go there first. And then I kind of thought, like, I would go to the U.K. next and then from the U.K. take it to the U.S. That's always been, like, my mind because in the U.K., in, Indian culture has been everywhere. there for five generations. Yeah. Yeah. In the U.S., we're in the second generation, maybe third, you know? So it hasn't had a chance to grow. You know, now we're getting the actors and actresses. But in the U.K., it's like I tripped out. I was walking in the street and I saw Indian models, like, modeling the clothes for the normal stores. <laughs> and I was like, are you guys cr serious? Like, this is really happening? Like, Indian people are selling me Gap right now? Like, I can't <laughs> believe this. And it was just such a crazy crazy amazing feeling and you know we have the BBC Asian network yeah we have a whole you know it's just like what's happening there I predict that it can happen here and I think that I have to really push in it in order for that to be a possibility it will but it's gonna take people like you to really it will make it and there's happen. gonna be more and someone that's watching me is inspired and it's gonna push them to go into beast mode and we need all the Indians to go into beast mode right now <laughs> you just initiated and like I'm initiating beast mode for all Indians <laughs> I did it. That is the single right now. That is the single. It's a great record. Thank you. So you wrote it alone, wrote it with people. No, no you wrote, collaborate. I so. collaborate. Yeah, I wrote it with Sydney um, uh, Tipton. She's a dope songwriter, and the uh, the Eleven is the producers. And we just wrote it at my house, and I left to India. And then like a month later, they sent me like a bounce, and they're like, and I had forgot about the song, and I was like, oh my god, it's so good. So <laughs> I was really excited because I feel like. The production on that song is different for yeah. a lot of the music that I do because, I mean, I'm more like underground. I have a lot of hip-hop stuff, but I write all kinds of music, and I found that when I was touring, like, my fans want to dance, and I want to dance. I'm a dancer. So I just really had fun with it, and I felt that it really accomplished this fusion in a real way. Like, da 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 I mean, that was my dream, to hear that on the radio. So I feel like this song is, you know, meant for the radio. Dude. On Are its you way. saying that on the song? Yeah, it's all. So you recorded that and kind of turned it into the production. Yeah, I, I always do that. I like the one of the first things I do if, if the producer doesn't have like a track already, I'll be like, cool, cool. Let me just give you some samples. Like the Timbaland, <laughs> Timbaland literally gives me a click. He just turns on a click. No key, no drums, nothing, and I'll just go on for like. 
few minutes and he'll be like, all right, I got enough. And then he'll just like make a beat out of my voice. Wow. It's Oof. insane. Wow. But I just, I, I just think I'm an instrument. I just try to find ways to get the rhythms and tones into the sound. What do you think your biggest, a- biggest asset in a room is, like creatively? What do you supply the most of? Energy. Good vibes. It's a good answer. Good energy. I just, you know, I'm po- I stay positive and I know that being able to make music is like a gift and like it should never not be fun. And, you know, I, I think that it's like channeling the divine. Like, you know, there's music playing, you know, in a different realm and it's like we just have to hear it and give it to the people. What, do you get those moments outside of the studio? Like, are you hit with inspiration when you're not in a recording studio? Yeah, I think like... I'm inspired by like things I see. I always say like God is the most amazing artist, like the best painter. Like sometimes I'll just see like a sunset and I'll think of some lyric or I'll see like an old person like talking to his like old wife and I'll be like, oh, and like, you know, like they're like this is like a little old couple or, you know, I like to people watch. I think like really great music has to be relatable. So I get lyric ideas, but I sometimes I just try to like observe when I'm out and then just make music when I'm in the studio so Got I can it. like channel it. You know, but sometimes a song will come and I'll be like, got to grab the phone and be like, it's, I was traveling, this is so random. I was traveling through this like, um, mountainous area in the North of India on the, the border of like Bangladesh. Um, it's called, it's like this area called, um, uh, Shillong is the area. And we were just driving through the hills and this song just kept going and it was like some melody and I had to pull the phone out and I called it like song of the mountains. Cause it was like, I don't know what energy just realized that there was an antenna present but they were like listen to this melody and i just had to sing it and then i don't know what will happen with it what was it do you remember it i don't remember it now it was just like it sounded like celtic i don't, can't <laughs> sing it off top but like, a, i have it in the phone it's the sounds of the mountain it was the sounds of the mountain i don't know maybe it'll be a sample on my first ep tribe there's like this little sample on the first track before anything starts and it's my parents singing like i had come home my mom always prays singing. My dad never sings. And I could hear them both singing. I just like turned the iPhone on and slid it into the room. <laughs> and then I had this iPhone recording and I had it for six years before I put it on the song. Oh, wow. So it's like, I don't know what that song of the mountain is. Maybe in five years I do some movie and it's like, I got to pull out the song of the mountain. I don't know. And you called yourself an antenna. I'm totally an antenna. 100%. I, yeah, it's like frequency. You just have to tune yourself. You have to be clear your mind so that you can hear the frequency. I have to get out of my own way and tell myself I'm not writing this song because the ego can't get in the way of the music. You have to like get out of the way and just listen. Easier said than done for a Very lot of much. people. Uh, there's sometimes I'm, I'm in California, so <laughs> it's a little bit easier for me to get the things that I need to get out of my own way. You know, a little... Yeah. little, little <laughs> Inhale, exhale. <laughs> California sticky green. You think that really, <laughs> does that like uh, just make the antenna a little bit stronger? It just makes the human leave and the alien take over. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be here, this person on this earth. Like, I want to, I want to make music that's out of this world. So I don't want to be thinking while I'm making music because that person thinking only has however many years on earth that I've lived experience. It's like, if I'm my greater self, my soul, my spiritual self, it's, I got thousands of years in that. So I can listen. <sighs> Dope. I know. I'm like I'm, I'm. I am ancient alien. I love like it. ancient aliens is like actually my teacher because I studied I, in college. I studied comparative religion, so I studied culture, history, ancient, <sighs> in, you know, ancient. Uh, For an artist, that is so valuable, dude. It was the best thing I did because I think I learned like about so many different religions and different people that I tried to find what was the universal truth. So it taught me about like writing things in a way that everybody can relate to. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was just, it was a good time to like learn. Like I have a lot of vocabulary from that time. You know, I can say crazy things. But like understanding so many different people and so many different practices and, you know. I'm being being, like sensitive to it. Like, you know, you go into a country if you don't know that like their cultures are that way, you can offend people. So it's just good to like, be aware, you know, like what, what you're doing. It's empathy related to knowledge and understanding. Yeah, and it's fun, man. Like I always had fun reading those things and I like to know where we came from and I have this like obsession with like the proto-culture, like what happened before the flood. Like I have these weird obsessions. So, I mean, I'll probably still delve into it. I'm still going to go back to school later and get the PhD at some point. Dude, you are fascinating. <laughs> Fascinating human. How is Iggy Azalea? Do you like working with her? Was she in the room? She was not in the room. Got it. Did you write a rap for her? I didn't write her rap. I wrote the chorus, and I'm singing the chorus on the song. Did somebody else write a rap? I'm not sure she had co-writers with what do you, her. What do you think of that? What do you think of like Cardi B? Who, who? No, how can I? I'm a co-writer. I just told you I believe in the co-writer. Yeah, but I think you... Cardi B 
Cardi B, she's the best because she says her songwriters' names. Like she yeah. has respect for them. And I oh, man, I love Cardi. You can't. But a lot of people stop don't... me from giving love to Cardi. <laughs> but no, dude, she deserves the respect and the love. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who don't acknowledge the ghostwriters, and that's not fun, and it's not fair. But you know, I think some people. They don't want the bubble to be like popped, like on the fact like they are the they are this only person. But music is made by like a collective, and people need to know that now. You know, like I think like the secret genius stuff that Spotify is doing, Love it. showing all the songwriters. Like I was driving and I saw Ali Tamposi, and I was like just thinking like, wow, what a time to be alive as a songwriter because like we're getting recognition when we never did. It's an know? understanding and, and an understanding of art but also embracing art from all different sides and under, like, wanting to know how a song that affects our lives is actually made yeah and i don't think it makes it uh, like less of a song it's like like on a song i just did like i wrote it in india with the co-writer then i came back and like my friend said hey why don't you change these three lines so she's listed as a writer it doesn't you know so it's like does this is a song less of a song because there's five writers no. but it's a better song because she gave me the right line like she switched out the line that didn't sound good and gave me the better line so i'm I don't care. I think the the music needs to be great. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Did you, know? you go into I did it writing it for yourself or was that supposed to be for somebody else? 100% for myself. Okay. Oh my. I had to get it off my chest. Yeah, was somebody doubting you? Was that directed to someone? Oh yeah. I think all my music. <laughs> 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 uh, I had like, you know, I um like all artists, we go through things especially dealing with like major labels and and politics and and uh being like the first of your kind and like being a pioneer. You know, people in this industry like to give you like like need to have an example. And the closest example was like MIA, but that's not what I'm trying to do, you know? So I think that it was hard to kind of understand, you know, the potential of it and that the fact that hip hop was authentic yeah. to an Indian culture. So, you know, I had to go to India and that's why I say like, you know, you could say I took the long way, but at least I know where I'm from, that mango juice with that Bombay, <laughs> you know, cause it's like, it's okay if it wasn't overnight, you know, it's okay because I did authentically and like, you know, people really know me, you know, for what I, what I stand for. And I mean, the words are pretty raw, but that's how I was feeling. You know, I just, I felt that, you know, people want to take advantage and, and want to take responsibility or like take credit for what you do. And it's like, no, I spent every single dime I made for as a songwriter investing in my artist career Dude, to put it off the ground. You did your whole India tour. I did my India tour. I put out the project and you know, it's good though, because I believed in myself and, and it doesn't matter how it happens as long as people see the, the results. And you know, now people can, you know, they just needed to see, I don't blame them. They needed to see it and now they see it. So everything's Gucci. <laughs> did, did somebody from a label try to say, like, dress differently, don't be this, Never. don't be that? Never. No, they'll always let you be Never. you. Well, they just might not believe. Who would dare to tell me to dress differently? <laughs> but they might just not believe in it or push it yeah, or make it a priority. Not, it may not be their thing. But you know what? Like, me going to India and, you know, rocking 10,000 people crowds and, like, you know, putting a video out and getting 2 million views 24 hours. Like, you can't tell me nothing now. Yeah. What? What's up? <laughs> What's good? You know, like, and that's all I needed. And now it's like, I don't blame people. You know, it's like, it's about, it's about show and tell in this industry, in this world, you know? So I'm just in that space now where it's like, it's time to just show them. I see it. I can't blame them for not seeing it. But, but sometimes like when you need to prove it, like that's it, when it's worth the most. But man, it lit the fire. It gave me this record and it gave me a lot more other records. And you know, it's, it's all good. It's all part of God's plan, man. So it's all good. I'm glad that this, I mean, Mute even was about that. I, they thought, the, not just about the labels, but people, you know. Wait, there just, was a lyric on Mute that was funny. Something about curry is soup. Yeah, it's like they thought the curry was soup. I had to feed these fools. I had to go home and regroup. I'm running back with the goons. Like, And now I got, you know, my one billion people. And now I got my goons. And they're all behind you. Yeah, line. yeah, yeah. They carry my, my people carry me. That's it. It's beautiful. <laughs> so I, I walk everywhere with the confidence of knowing that, you know, I have the support of my people. So I don't have to change who I am. I can just be who I am. And, it, you know, people, either they love it or they love it, usually. I don't know. <laughs> they love it or they love it. They love it or they love it. It's, you know, they love it or they're going to love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going like to like yeah. be in your face. Dude, it's very special. Your story is... Uh, it's phenomenal. I mean, just, you know, b being raised the way you have and th this idea that, like, you know, you just totally accepted who you were and you weren't going to let American culture influence that or change that. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of kids could have easily been swayed, right? Like, I, you yeah. know, I have my extended family is from a different country and they came here and, dude, those kids got Americanized real quick. Yeah, I mean, I am American. That's but, the other thing. But I think that, you know what it was? It was the dance. 
I loved the dance so much. It meant so much to me that I could never let it go. There was definitely times, like, I wouldn't tell people I danced, like, at school. Like, I had two lives. I would go tour India, and they'd be like, where were you all summer? I'd be like, oh. <laughs> I didn't tell around. them. You know, I did a 15 city tour by myself, two hour shows, and like just rocked India real quick. But yeah, I don't yeah. tell them that kind yeah. of thing, you know, because I was like hiding it. But it was the love of the art. I could never, I could never abandon it. And then I was just like, we got to find a middle way. We got to find a middle <laughs> ground because I'm going to always want to wear Indian jewelry. I'm going to always want to do classical dance I'm not gonna stop doing this I don't know how to not do that you know if I hear music I dance like this so I gotta figure out how to make music that this fits to yeah because it's, it's not going anywhere it's in my blood you know it's just I can't undo it Raja Kumari thanks for hanging out thank you so much thank you I did it so give it a listen thanks for spending time yeah thanks I really hope you enjoyed that conversation if you did, please subscribe and also check out our podcast. There's a link in the description and also comment and like and do things. Other interviews are on the screen somewhere. So click them. Thanks for watching.